Good morning and welcome back into the uh, morning session. We've uh, got a great speaker for us uh, after the break. Um, all the rowdy ones in the back, the Marines back there, if you just sit down please, we'll get started. Um, I have the distinct honor and real pleasure of introducing a friend of mine, uh, retired Colonel Pam Melroy, as our next speaker. Uh, Pam is not a stranger to most of you, I know. She is currently the Deputy Administrator of NASA and doing an amazing job keeping Bill Nelson, a politician, focused on technology. Right, Pam? Thank you. Uh, she's had an amazing career serving our nation. Uh, she's an Air Force officer, a combat veteran as a NASA astronaut. Uh, she was one of only two female shuttle commanders uh, in history and, in fact, was the commander of the shuttle that uh, brought supplies to the commander, Peggy Whitson, where we had two female commanders on orbit at the same time, a very historic moment. Uh, and of course, they both didn't care whether they were female or male, and neither did their crews, who were whipped into shape pretty well. Um, she's now helping manage the future efforts of NASA, focusing on Artemis, uh, as well as all the other challenges that we're uh, facing in space. It's a demanding position, but she is the right person in the right place right now for NASA, and I believe uh, is going to have a very significant impact on where we go in human spaceflight in the future. There are a lot of amazing things coming, and she's going to tell you about them. So it's a pleasure to have her back at the Space Symposium, representing the men and women of NASA. And uh, Pam, please join me on the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank. I appreciate that. Usually I'm the rowdy one in the back. So on behalf of Administrator Nelson, it's my pleasure to speak with you today in this wonderful venue at a very auspicious moment in our history. I think it's fair to say NASA has never been busier or more productive. We're firing on all cylinders in every single mission directorate bringing to reality major transformational milestones which are going to change the aerospace community. And this is against a backdrop where space is increase, increasingly crucial to the lives of every citizen on Earth. You, our partners, see it too when you're making it happen. Today, I'm going to give you an update on the impact of the recently announced President's 2023 budget on NASA's portfolio across human spaceflight, science, technology, aeronautics, and human spaceflight. And I'm going to share our priorities and where we hope they will take us. Let me begin by saying we want that future to be inclusive and to be the strongest we can be by drawing talent, innovation, and inspiration from people of all backgrounds, perspectives, and nations. So, just last week, President Biden unveiled his budget request for fiscal year 2023, and the news is good for NASA. The $26 billion fiscal year 2023 budget request is 8% more than enacted federal spending levels for fiscal year 2022, affirming the importance of civil space to the Biden-Harris administration and to the strategic future of the United States. It represents the largest overall request in current dollars for NASA and the largest request for science funding in agency history. It's an investment in good paying jobs and the businesses that partner with NASA across all 50 states. It will help us address climate change and it helps NASA provide more opportunities in STEM education and promotes our core values of diversity and equity. I'll start out with space operations. Together with our international partners and our astronauts in orbit above us right now on the International Space Station, we continue to advance microgravity science and prepare us for missions to further destinations. Last week, Mark Vandehei returned to Earth, ending a record-setting journey of 355 days. Thank you. Yes, we're so excited. So Mark's long duration flight actually is showing us how humans can leave this planet for extended periods of time. And our congratulations to Mark on this incredible milestone in human spaceflight. 
This budget aligns with the administration's direction to extend the International Space Station operations to 2030, and we look forward to working with our international partners to achieve that. With over $220 million for commercial LEO destinations in this budget request, we will continue to work with our industry partners to lay the foundation for a follow-on commercial destination and continue to develop the commercial new space economy. Those kids today who are inspired by seeing experiments in microgravity or even just an astronaut doing a backflip in space, they're gonna be the ones who will be doing them on the next generation of commercial platforms. They will be the next entrepreneurs and researchers in LEO and potentially at the moon and beyond. Even to somebody who's been in the space business for a while, it's pretty incredible to see how many milestones have occurred in commercial space flight in just the last couple of years. The capabilities of our commercial partners are growing all the time. I know all of you are aware that the Axiom-1 mission, the first private astronaut mission to the International Space Station, will launch on Friday. And our congratulations to the Axiom and NASA teams that helped make that happen. And just ahead of us is the fourth commercial crew launch to the International Space Station by SpaceX with Boeing's system for launching astronauts on the way, not to mention all the suborbital human spaceflight capabilities that have been demonstrated and are being demonstrated on a routine basis. The way I see this is just as NASA's investments in aeronautics seeded the golden age of aviation in the 50s and the 60s, NASA investments, along with other government investments, have seeded where we are today. I believe history will look back and say that we are in the golden age of commercial space. And it's pretty exciting to be living in it. I'd like to switch gears and talk about science for a moment. Even with a pretty lofty and ambitious portfolio at NASA, space science astounds us and inspires us. In this sea of incredible space news that we're hearing every day, I think none of us overlooked the amazing feat of launching the Webb Telescope. The world watched as we worked through hundreds of single point failures and now have come to the point where every optical parameter that has been checked and tested is performing at or above expectations. The observatory is able to successfully gather and focus light from different distant objects and deliver it to its instruments without issue. There's still work to go, but prepare for Webb's amazing science this year. I really want to congratulate the NASA team, our industry partners, Northrop Grumman, Ball Aerospace, and our ESA and Canadian partners on that success. The world has joined us on the journey, and we've just announced that 620 community organizations are going to be hosting Webb First Light events with us. This is part of a strategy. This strategy of sharing the ups and the downs and the drama of each step of the scientific journey is a strategy that we are hoping will help everyone understand how science works. The budget uh, pr proposal also allows us to continue to make progress with the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which will complement Webb's deep view into the cosmos by taking a survey view to help us understand galaxies and exoplanets in the universe. Asteroids also continue to be at the forefront of the world's consciousness. This year we will launch Psyche to study a very different kind of asteroid, and we anticipate our planetary protection mission, DART. This fall will help us shed light on a potential deflection technology that perhaps we could use on a dangerous near-Earth object. The President's budget will also uh, enable our Mars sample return, whoop, okay, not quite the right, did I, oh, can you go back one? What am I showing? Nope, go, go to the next one, thank you. Mars sample return. President's budget will also enable our Mars sample return mission in partnership with ESA, which will revolutionize our understanding of Mars by returning samples 
for study using the most sophisticated instruments on the, around the world. And that work is already underway with the Perseverance rover collecting those samples, even as the rover continues on-site search for signs of ancient, ancient life. Those samples could be the best opportunity to reveal Mars's early evolution and potential for life. This mission is a huge challenge. It's an enormous technical challenge. We'll have a lot of firsts on this mission, including the first time several vehicles would land on a surface of Mars orchestrated around the same time. It will also be the first launch from the surface of another planet with the Mars Ascent Vehicle and the first international interplanetary relay effort using multiple missions to bring back a sample from another planet. This is also a very exciting year for aeronautics. We are back in the X-plane business in a big way. We intend to lead in green aerospace, including our X-57 all-electric aircraft scheduled for flight tests this year. And additionally, the 2023 budget enables us to begin planning for the next X-plane through the Sustainable Flight National Partnership, which will demonstrate flight efficiency capabilities that can transition directly to narrow body civil aviation. We also continue enthusiastically in the X-plane business with the X-59 later this year, which will demonstrate how we can mitigate sonic booms and we hope lead to persistent supersonic commercial flight. I'll go on to space technology. Our space technology work continues the tech mat, early stage innovation and partnerships that are truly the seed corn of the agency. These partnerships help us develop the technologies of tomorrow that will fulfill our vision of exploration. Satellite servicing, fission surface power, and a test of a new type of heat shield for atmospheric reentry that will help us deliver much heavier payloads are just a few of the things on tap. In this budget, we're also demonstrating our commitment to nuclear propulsion, which will enable enable greater capabilities across the science and the human spaceflight portfolio. And of course, Artemis. This budget request supports our Artemis program, helping us get to a sustained, resilient cadence of missions in the future. I was personally honored to see the rollout of the SLS rocket in Orion for Artemis One. It was very emotional and very historic. We are working through wet dress rehearsal. First time you do anything, you learn a lot. And uh, we will continue to work through that uh, to do all the testing, the checks and a fuel test that we need. And then that will allow the countdown to the moon beginning. Even before Artemis One, we had the capstone launching next month to explore the lunar orbit where our astronauts will live and work in space. Capstone is a 55 pound CubeSat the size of a microwave oven that will serve as the first spacecraft to test a unique elliptical lunar orbit. That same near rectilinear halo orbit is planned for NASA's Gateway, the moon orbiting outpost and logistics cache that's part of the Artemis program. Capstone will validate the power and propulsion requirements for maintaining that unique orbit, helping us refine our models and ensure that we will be able to operate the gateway efficiently. NASA also announced plans two weeks ago to create additional opportunities for industry to develop an astronaut moon lander. This path enables resiliency and competition. Under this new approach, NASA is asking American companies to propose lander concepts capable of ferrying astronauts between lunar orbit and the lunar surface for missions beyond Artemis III. This path is in parallel to our work with SpaceX on the demonstration of its landing system to land the first humans on the moon in 50 years, including the first woman. Our next generation of science at the moon will get a big boost uh, in preparation for astronaut science with US companies delivering scientific instruments and technology demos to the lunar surface. We continue to select payloads 
delivery by industry through commercial lunar payload services, or CLPS, with NASA as just one of many customers. And among those payloads is Viper, the rover that will develop a map at the south pole of the concentration and location of water ice that could eventually be harvested to sustain human exploration on the moon. We are forging the Artemis generation. I myself was very inspired to follow my career path by the accomplishments of the Apollo program. But we're poised to do so much more than that to build on that legacy, including also landing the first person of color on the moon. We never forget, we are standing on the shoulders of giants. The men who landed on the moon and the women who did the math. I'd like to shift gear ne gears now and talk about the agency's priorities. First and foremost, we will continue to be a global leader in science, aeronautics, space technology, and human spaceflight. But in addition for the agency, we have three cross-cutting priorities, climate, workforce, and the moon to Mars strategy. Our changing climate is creating an existential threat to all of us crew members of Spaceship Earth. And NASA is uniquely positioned through our Earth Science Program to contribute to one of the first key priorities of NASA, understanding climate change. This year, with our international partners, we initiate the Earth System Observatory, a series of Earth-observing satellites that will measure key parameters to improve the world's understanding of climate change. As we have measured Earth in the past, we've discovered that the most important thing to quantify is not just water or weather, soil moisture, or any individual thing, but actually to study Earth as a system. And so NASA's work here in the Earth System Observatory is critical for the entire planet. I've already mentioned our efforts in aeronautics around green aviation. We will continue to integrate our climate efforts across the agency for maximum synergy. And we will initiate the Earth Information Center, an effort to bring together our space-based climate data, along with data from our interagency and international partners, into one place. This will help make it more accessible to scientists, yes, but it, we really intend to make it more accessible to decision makers and also all citizens, especially in our communities that are most affected by climate change. Our next priority is our workforce, because they're our backbone. We've recently gone through an enterprise transformation in our mission support directorate, and we will continue to encourage and facilitate a one NASA, one team approach to everything we do. We recognize that our investments in commercial space have broadened the pool of choices available to us for how we accomplish our work. Understanding the best practices in those kinds of partnerships and defining the unique and crucial role of the NASA workforce for the future is a key priority. The future of work is something every single person in this room is wrestling with. I think we all feel exhilarated, maybe a little daunted to all be together again. We believe that getting that right is absolutely essential to support a future where we're still the employer of choice. And although this is mostly an inward facing priority, we also intend to work with our industry and government partners to advance a diverse pipeline and workforce for the entire community. Now I'd like to talk about our Moon to Mars strategy. This is a special moment for us as we prepare to launch Artemis I. We have a pretty solid plan laid out through Artemis IV. We have hardware for each of those missions, either fully completed or under construction. We have clear goals for each of those missions. But there's a lot of questions we have to answer about what comes next. So as we prepare to launch Artemis I, this is a great time for us to stop and think about our Moon to Mars strategy. This is a cross-cutting priority for the agency. 
Although the Exploration Systems Directorate, led by Jim Free, is responsible for executing the Artemis campaign, the goal of solar system exploration actually spans all the mission directorates. And yes, I mean all. Aeronautics work in hypersonics directly supports entry, descent, and landing. We see capabilities such as the current Ingenuity helicopter on Mars just completed its 22nd flight, and the future Dragonfly aerial vehicle on Titan. We're going to continue to see the seams between air and space blur. And science, of course, is front and center in exploration. We have come so far since Apollo. So our astronauts on Apollo had a scientific tool. It was a scoop that allowed them to pick up rocks to put into a box and bring home. Those samples have proved to be a treasure for the whole world. But think how far we've come in science since then. The science we will be able to do in situ with more sophisticated instruments, with maps of water ice and other resources available re real time, not to mention the advances we're making in communications so that we can uh, have high-speed data returned to the Earth, surface transportation that will allow us to row further, and human and machine teaming capabilities. We think they're going to transform science on the Moon and Mars. I referenced the Mars sample return earlier. That will be absolutely essential science to have. It will help shape and guide our Moon to Mars science strategy, particularly in the area of where we send humans in the future. So now we're ready to move just beyond a visit. In order to do that, we need to build a scalable infrastructure capability to pro provide that foundation for living and working on another planet. I'm talking about communications, position navigation and timing, power, in situ, resource utilization, prepared landing areas, and other things. So just as NASA has done with commercial crew and commercial cargo, industry is looking to us to help us prove the business case for transportation and potentially these other infrastructure areas and to help shape the rule of law that guides a new frontier and to help create an environment where industry's innovation and partnership can continue to advance what's possible. Our goal is to create a blueprint, a blueprint for sustained human presence and exploration throughout the solar system. We will build objectives in these areas that I've mentioned they will act as our guidepost over the next two decades as individual programs advance and technologies advance to help ensure that the things that we're doing are integrated and stay focused on that goal. We need to be very clear about what it is we are doing on the moon that gets us to Mars. We will practice developing this blueprint on the moon and then we will demonstrate it on Mars in preparation for other destinations. We don't undertake this responsibility lightly. Underpinning our approach is the essential belief that it's going to be a global effort. And by that, I mean not only worldwide in a geographic sense, but also global in the sense that many fields, partners, and disciplines will have to be involved in this work. Yes, we need scientists and engineers, and we need artists. We need partnership with nations of all sizes and companies both large and small. Academia, citizen scientists, the students just starting school today, and those entering the workforce. And of course, our mentors who will help pass on the lessons that we have all fought to learn over these many decades. NASA is kicking off an effort for consultation to define these objectives with our partners, both industry and international, so that we are addressing the priorities of nations and industry in developing this blueprint. We recognize that the things that we do will carry precedent. And that means how we go is just as important as what we do. 
In the spirit of peaceful exploration, it will mean adhering to our values of openness, transparency, shared data, and a commitment to norms to help us work together. We are helping to establish that playing field through the Artemis Accords. I'm proud to say that Singapore joined us last week as the 18th signatory, and more are on the way. The Artemis Accords are fairly simple. They're a set of principles grounded in the 1967 Outer Space Treaty, by which our signatories commit to behave in a rules-based, responsible way in their space exploration activities. They're based on universal principles that will enable the next generation of international partnerships for the exploration of the moon, Mars, and beyond. These principles encompass transparency, interoperability, deconflicting activities, and tackling critical issues such as orbital debris. Today, the Accords don't answer every question, and we know that. But they do indicate each nation that has signed them, they have a commitment to start this conversation and bring us down a path that is more rules-based. We must be so mindful to bring the very best of humanity out into space. Everything that I've been talking about is a long game, and that's the space business, right? You don't send a telescope a million miles away with 344 points of single failure to work through, or plan to send an aircraft to Titan without a lot of planning. That's what it takes to raise the bar of human achievement, and it doesn't happen overnight. I've covered a lot of ground today, but I wanted to be sure that everyone was aware of the scope of the work uh, that's going on in space and where we're focused. Just want to say, if you work in industry, you have a place in NASA's plans for the future. It's a global plan. If you're a student or earlier in your career, wow, there's a lot happening. To our international and our intergovernmental partners, current and yet to come, I just say thank you. Your expertise, perspective, and friendship will help us do what we do in a better way. If you've seen the pictures of the SLS rocket stacked on the pad with Orion, you know that the dream of going beyond low Earth orbit with humans is no longer deferred. It's a dream we can all share. And we at NASA look forward to working with all of you in the coming months and years. Thank you. Thank you, Pam Melroy. My name is Shana Hume. I'm a PhD student at the University of Colorado Boulder doing my research in Mars EDL. I'm also a member of the Space Generation Advisory Council and the Deputy Manager for our annual Space Generation Congress, which this year will be held in Paris. However, most importantly today, I am also an alumni of the Matthew Isakowitz Fellowship Program, a pipeline to bring young leaders